It's good to be at the house of the Lord this evening. Thankful for the attendance of each and every one. Thankful for the sacrifice that each one has made. Uh, especially good to see Sister Peggy again. It's always good to be with God's family, and we just trust that uh, uh, the sacrifice that each of us has made will be rewarded as we study together, as we worship together, as we send heavenward a spiritual sacrifice. The idea of overcoming is that which conjures up quite an exciting emotion. Uh, if we are our loved ones overcome some life-threatening disease, there's reason to rejoice. There's reason to be happy. In Revelations 2, verse 7, Jesus said, To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life. Him that overcometh. Of course, that is the language of victory. We don't place much value in worldly victories. Some folks get pretty enthralled in uh, worldly achievement, and uh, they get uh, real enthralled and real excited about worldly crowns. But the Christian finds his or her foremost interest in that victory which has real value, that victory which has lasting value, the race to win the heavenly crown. The Christian life is a battle, but it also must be a victory. And no matter the temptation, no matter the trial, some have always prevailed against the God of this world. Thayer de defines the word overcome as it is used there in Revelations 2 of this, de uh, defines it this way. Of Christians, he says, it is they that hold fast their faith even unto death against the power of their foes, against their temptations, and against their persecutions. If we are Christians this afternoon, not just those who have been baptized in the body of Christ, but those who really believe that when Jesus in Matthew 7 verse 14 said there would be few that find the straight and narrow way, then we value and we appreciate the fact that we can overcome. And we can overcome, of course, because we have a Savior. Alas, and did my, sovereign, uh, did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Would He devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? And the answer came, yes, I'll die for the sinner. The answer came, yes, I'll die for old Tim, and the sins that he will need remitted, I'll make intercession for the transgressor. Today, we can overcome, my brethren and friends, because not only do we have a Savior, but we have a saving place. We have a saving place. All oh, this afternoon, when I see that old rugged cross upon which my Savior bled, and He suffered and He died, it causes me to understand uh, without the cross there would be no saving place. There would be no church. The Apostle Paul penned in Ephesians 3, verse 10, he said, To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose when he, which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. God had great interest in an institution known as the church even from the beginning of time. As we suggested Wednesday evening, it was part of the eternal purpose. And we suggest to you this afternoon that it is an actuality, that the church is a thing definite, that it was fixed by the God of our being, that it was established for the consideration of all humanity. And how wonderful that it is to have a saving place. Now, this evening, let's notice some things in our lesson. Let's, some, let's notice some things about this saving place. First of all, of this saving place, we notice that we can read of it in the Bible. We can read of it in the Bible. In Matthew 16, in verse 18, Jesus said, Upon this rock 
I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now we know that Jesus accomplished his mission to build his church because, <clears throat> excuse me, in Acts 2 and verse 47, we find that men there on that occasion were being added to it. These men had heard the first gospel sermon preached by the apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost, and the preaching of the cross had pricked their hearts, and they cried, you remember, and said unto Peter and the other apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall we do? These men desired a saving place. Not a saving place in their sins, but a saving place from their sins. Men can't live in sin and expect to have a saving place. These men wanted a saving place from their sins, and Peter answered and said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Acts 2, verse 38. And the following verses reveal that those who gladly received the word were baptized, and the Lord added them to the church. We can read of it. We can read of this saving place in the Bible. Now, according to reports, where such things are considered, there are how many in our day and time? 1,500, maybe 2,000? I don't know. A great number of different religious bodies in our land. And they differ in doctrine. They differ in worship. They differ in organization. They can't all be the saving place. It would be a reflection upon our audience this afternoon if I were to indicate and I were to expect you to believe that all these many religious bodies are the one thing mentioned by the Christ. Jesus only promised to build one church. And we can read of it in the Bible. Now here's something else. Secondly, something else about this saving place. And that is the fact that it is blood bought. It's blood bought. To, to the elders of the church at Ephesus, Paul spoke this in Acts the 20th chapter. Acts 20 and verse 28. Acts 20 verse 28 Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. It was the blood of Jesus that made possible that opportunity to have their sins remitted. Further, in the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews the ninth chapter, Hebrews 9, notice there verse 24, Hebrews 9, verse 24, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered in the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. It was Christ who died. It was Christ who shed his blood. We find also in the book of Colossians, in Colossians 1, verse 13 and 14, speaking of Christ, of the Father, it says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And then in the book of Ephesians, in Ephesians the fifth chapter, Ephesians 5, verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And so, my brethren and friends, how can we be any further impressed with the interest that heaven, think about it, the interest that heaven had for you and the interest that heaven had for me to provide us 
a saving place by sending the Son of God to shed his blood and to give his life a ransom for the sins of the whole world. Nowadays, if men have uh, a little money, or maybe even more importantly, uh, a little media, they can start about anything that they want to start. They can believe about whatever they want to believe, and maybe then, you know, get a little cash flowing in and then get some media behind them. And the first thing you know, they have a following. But the church of Christ, it was bought and it was paid for with the blood of the sinless Son of God, Jesus Christ. And yes, you can overcome and I can overcome. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Friends, if you are not in this saving place, the church, this afternoon, you need to be. You need to be. Because here is something else. Thirdly, this afternoon, this saving place has Jesus as its solid foundation. It's solid foundation. He represents that which cannot be moved. It will provide stability against the assault of any destructive force. Isaiah prophesied of this foundation in the book of Isaiah in Isaiah 28 and verse 16. Isaiah 28 verse 16, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. We notice three, three words there. Tried, precious, and sure. And those words, my brethren and friends, they still beautifully identify the foundation of the church of our Lord. In 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11, Paul wrote, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is Jesus Christ. And then he further penned in the book of Ephesians, in Ephesians the second chapter, Ephesians 2, verse 19 and 20. He says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So there he is. He is, notice, the chief cornerstone. Not Peter, not John the Baptist, not Martin Luther, not John Calvin, not Alexander Campbell, not Ellen G. White, not Joseph Smith, not John Wesley, but Jesus Christ himself, the sure foundation that Isaiah prophesied of. Men we know, of course, through the ages, they've not been satisfied and they've built and they've founded and they've established. But an organization, my brethren and friends, or an institution that does not have Christ as the foundation, it cannot stand. It will not be successful in the test of judgment. In Acts 4, verse 12, the apostle Peter declared, There is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now, religions of the world that reject Jesus Christ, they may be growing in great numbers. And they are. They are. We have to admit that. But they build on a foundation that is not tried. They build on a foundation that is not precious. They build on a foundation that is not sure because they build not on Jesus. And today, I am grateful for the church. I'm grateful for the saving place. I'm thankful for its sure foundation, a precious truth 
which I can hold out to my wife, to my, to my children, to my grandchildren, to my family, as that which we can lean on not only here in this life, but we can lean on in eternity. Well, what about the name of this saving place? The saving place we speak of wears a name that glorifies the builder. What is the name of the church as spoken of in the Bible? Well, it is referred to in various ways in God's Word. It is called the church of God in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 1. In 1 Timothy 3.15, it is referred to as the pillar and ground of the truth. In 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 9, it is called God's building. Yet again, in Galatians 6 and verse 10, it is referred to as the household of faith. In Hebrews 12 and verse 23, it is referred to as the church of the firstborn. And these verses, of course, convey, convey the idea of that which is definite. They convey oneness. They convey distinctiveness. And these are Bible names. And although different names are attached to it, yet they all refer to the same institution and they all glorify the builder, Jesus Christ. How were the members of the church referred to in Paul's day? In the infancy of this body. When the writer had in mind their relationship to Christ, they were properly called Christians. With reference to the fact that they were learners and students, they were called disciples. With reference to their rela relationship to one another, they were called brethren. With reference to their character and purity of life, they were called saints. And together they made up the body of Christ or the church of Christ. To the brethren at Rome, in Romans 16, 16, Paul wrote, the churches of Christ salute you. My brethren and friends, we have a saving place. We have a saving place. And we are grateful to lift up, and we are grateful to be able to build up that saving place, and to invite others to be added to that which had its origin in the mind of God before the world was ever framed. Now, when Christians live for the Lord, it is much easier to build up this saving place. Notice the requirement that Jesus placed upon his followers in the book of Matthew, in Matthew the fifth chapter, Matthew 5, there, verse 13. He said, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Verse 14, Ye are the light of the world, a city that is set on an hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. By the word they teach and by their example of life, all Christians show what God requires. They show what is the way of duty. They point and they show forth the way that leads to heaven. The Apostle Paul wrote in the book of Galatians, in Galatians we notice there the second chapter, Galatians 2 and verse 20. Galatians 2 and verse 20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I. But Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Christ is to be seen through Christians. He does not live today and walk upon the earth today in the flesh, but he lives and he shows forth his beauty in the lives of those men, women, boys and girls who have dedicated their life to him. The Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians and Philippians the first chapter, notice there Philippians 1 and verse 21. Philippians 1 verse 21 for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. 
Now, how would Christ be shown forth? Notice verse 20. According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For the church, the saving place, to be built up, there must be 100% living for Christ. And when this is done, the builder is glorified. When this is done, it becomes apparent that Christianity is not just a way of living, but rather it is a way of life. A way of life uh, in every relationship, in business, at home, or in public, in prosperity, or adversity. We notice in Philippians 2, Paul again wrote, as he uh, wrote to the church at Philippi, Philippians 2, verse 14, Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. And so when individuals live without rebuke, that is, where a justifiable accusation against them cannot be made, it's going to do something. It's going to influence others. Others may be one to be Christians also. They will be led to honor God. And so this saving place, the church, it glorifies the builder, and our lives should glorify God, and they should reflect a dedication to building up that institution of which all Christians have been added to. Well, we look further, and we find that we can overcome because we have a saving place, and I think this is important, this is important, that worships according to the New Testament pattern. It worships according to the New Testament pattern. And I am thankful, my brethren and friends, that we can say that this afternoon. In John 17, verse 17, Jesus said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now we recognize the Bible as our only rule of faith and practice. As in all other matters, our worship must be governed by divine authority. And if we would worship acceptably, we must worship according to truth. Now this afternoon, we can say without any reservation that we are not ashamed to pattern our worship after the primitive New Testament church. For, for we believe that God will accept such only and that New Testament worship will accomplish for the worshiper what its designer intended. Now, first of all, the early church, they prayed together in their assembly. And, and we follow that pattern today, don't we? Jesus is our reconciliator, our mediator. He is our advocate through whom we are to approach the throne of grace. We end our prayers in Jesus' name. He is our mediator. And, and we are blessed to have been taught through God's Word the value of just a simple, orderly way of praying. And we count it a privilege, don't we, to, to bow together as we do in our worship. We bow together as God's family in an assembly of the church and we approach the Father in Jesus' name in prayer. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for how, how heaven designed that for us. Secondly, the, the early church also had teaching during their assembly. We read in the book of Acts, in Acts the 11th chapter, Acts 11, notice there verse 25 and verse 26. It says, Then departed uh, Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. When the early church assembled for worship, those in attendance were taught. They were taught. Notice they were taught. They were not entertained. The Scripture records or implies nothing about uh, telling jokes. 
It, it, don't, it don't share anything about our responsibility as teachers, you know, to share humorous presentations to keep the audience interested. We have no command or example for what is often used today by re religious organizations to reach their listeners, such as puppet shows and concerts and so forth. Brother Larry Robertson used to say, Brethren, if it takes bingo, if it takes hot dog suppers, if it takes cakewalks to bring them in, it will take that and more of it to keep them. And that's the truth. And so we need to nurture, and we do, we need to nurture New Testament teaching, which includes reproving, rebuking, and exhorting. The church has been blessed, both past and present, to have men who faithfully handle God's Word. We value the teaching service, one speaking at a time, and we pray for our teachers. Thirdly, this afternoon, we appreciate what heaven designed the giving to be. In 1 Corinthians, the 16th chapter, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2, says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. On the first day of the week, and of course, every week has a first day, there was a collection or, or a contribution taken at the assemblies of the early church. Each gave as he had been prospered. We simply, today, we follow that pattern. We, again, we don't sponsor concerts. We don't, we don't sponsor car washes. We don't, we don't sponsor pancake suppers to have money in the treasury. Folks, do you see what we have to be thankful for? Heaven's design. And then there is the music of the church. Again, we're not ashamed to align ourselves with the New Testament church. Ephesians 5, verse 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now we realize to many that what one observes when they visit our service is different from what is usually practiced in many places of worship. Our song service is without instrumental accompaniment or a cappella. Uh, the music of the New Testament church, though, was the music known as vocal music. It, it is produced by the vocal cords of a human being. It is therefore alive. It is alive. It comes from within the individual. It, it comes from God's own creation. We have no authority to make music in our assembly in any other way. And then fifthly, in our worship also, every first day of the week, we partake of the Lord's Supper or the communion. It was the practice of the early church to come together on the first day of the week to break bread, Acts 20, verse 7. And we follow that example today. The pattern of that memorial is not hard to understand. It, it helps us not to forget the sacrifice that was paid for us upon the cross. That memorial instituted by our Lord, it, refle it reflects the oneness of of the one pure lamb that was sacrificed to take away the sins of the world. And we're thankful for its primitive beauty. And we're grateful for the worship of the church that was designed and authorized by heaven and not by men. Not by men. And how wonderful to be a part of and to be in this saving place. Well, as we um, start to wind down our presentation here this afternoon, we just have to be impressed with this fact that we can overcome because in this saving place, we have rules of entry. 
we have rules of entry. And those rules of entry, unlike the religious world around us, they have not changed, brethren and friends, since the days of the early church. Men cannot change them. And God hasn't changed. God hasn't changed. The terms or the rules of entry to this saving place have been ordained by heaven. First, Jesus the mediator said, Except ye believe that I am He, ye shall die in your sins. In Hebrews 11 verse 6, Paul said, Without faith it is impossible to please Him. Faith is produced by the Word of God. And one must believe that Word. And one must believe in Jesus as the Christ. Secondly, Jesus gives the next step to salvation in Luke, the 13th chapter in verse 3, when he says, I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Repentance means to turn. To turn from allegiance to the God of this world, to no longer serve Him, but to make a U-turn in our life and pledge our allegiance to the God of heaven and His Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Repentance is often defined as being sorry for sin and so sorry that you turn from sin. Again, to, 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 to pledge our allegiance, as it were, to the God of heaven and to His Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And then thirdly, Jesus, the mediator, tells us something else that we must, uh, that we must do, we must be willing to do to be saved. In Matthew 10, verse 32, he says, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. You see, we must be willing to confess Christ as the Son of God before men on earth, that he will confess us before the Father in heaven. And then the final step is the step which puts us into Christ or into His body, the church. When Jesus the mediator picked out His apostles or His ambassadors, He told them something to do. In Mark 16, verse 15 and 16, He said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Baptism is the final step which puts us into Christ, which makes us free from sin. Paul said, for by one spirit are we all baptized into how many bodies? Five bodies? Ten bodies? Many bodies? No. All baptized into one body. Oh, the saving place which Jesus built. This afternoon, are you in that saving place? If not, you need to be. If you have obeyed the gospel, but you have strayed from the path of right and duty, you need to come back to the safe harbor. We offer at this time a song of invitation. If you are subject to heaven's call in either condition, come as we stand and as we sing.